So thank you everybody for coming to the second uh, talk of our seminar series on game decision and networks. And for those of you who were not here last time, this is a new series uh, that looks at these topics from the perspective of computer science, control, economics, and operational research. And I wanted to take just one moment to thank our advisory board. So uh, they really help us in putting together the list of speakers for our seminar. It is super exciting. Um, and just before introducing today's uh, speaker, just let me remind you that if you want more information about the seminar series or you want to join our mailing list, you can do that at the um, address that is in this slide. Um, okay, and um, another thing, just like for the format of the presentation, so our speaker will talk for 15 minutes and after that we'll have a Q&A session. Um, so during the talk, if you have questions about technical things or aspects you don't understand, you can write that on the chat and I will relay that to the speaker. And then uh, at the end in the Q&A session, I will enable you to also uh, participate with a video and audio and so you can ask questions directly. Okay, so without any further ado, let me introduce the speaker for today. So today we have Aaron Roth from University of Pennsylvania. So Aaron is a professor of computer and information science, um, is affiliated with the Warren Center for Network and Data Science, and is a co-director of Network and Social Systems Engineering uh, program, and is also an Amazon scholar. And Aaron's research uh, is focused broadly on algorithmic foundation, on data privacy, algorithmic fairness, game theory, and machine learning. And he has been recognized by many awards. Um, so among those, NSF Career and Picasso Award, Sloan Research Fellowship, and several research awards from Yahoo, Amazon, and Google. He also has written some uh, key books in this area. So let me just mention the Algorithmic Foundation of Differential Privacy, together with Cynthia Work, and the Ethical Algorithm with Michael Kurtz. And so today is gonna talk about some recent work on online multivalued learning. And so with that, we're very much looking forward to your talk, Aaron, and I'll leave the field to you. All right, thank you. Let's see, let me try to yes. share my screen. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, and, and I want to, yeah, I know there's um, the word games in the in the seminar um, title. So the talk, the title of my talk, you know, it's going to make it sound like a machine learning talk, but but rest assured, game theory plays a, a key role in the in the derivation and analysis of what we're going to do. And this is joint work with a bunch of terrific people, uh, Varun Gupta, Chris Jung, uh, George Narav, and Malash Pai. Okay, so at a high level, we have a you know pretty simple and fundamental goal. We want to be able to make predictions in a sequential setting where we need to you know predict what's going to happen today before we know what's going to happen tomorrow, and we'd like to be able to endow our predictions with uncertainty estimates. So we'd like to not just be able to make sort of point predictions, but we'd like to be able to, in some well-grounded way, enunciate how sure we are about our predictions. And we'd like to do this without having to make any assumptions at all about the data. Okay, so that's, that's our goal for today. That's what we're gonna try to do. And I wanna, um, starts maybe with you know like a, a little cartoon just to keep something in mind to, to ask the question you know both what do and what should reported uncertainty estimates actually mean okay so, so you know just to pick a an example entirely out of thin air imagine that we're in the early stages of a global pandemic okay and so patients are coming into the hospital and uh, what you want to do is you want to predict how the course of their disease is going to progress. So you want to predict like the severity of their disease in you know two or three days time so that you can triage hospital resources. Okay. And, and so maybe you know you come into the hospital and, and the doctor looks at your chart and says, well, okay, given everything I can see about you, given your features X, um, our model predicts that you're expected to be disease severity in two days time is, is something, F of X. And you know, they're gonna make some decision about how to triage resources that's gonna be kind of important for you personally. And so you might very well ask, you know, how, how sure are you about this prediction? 
and there's various things the doctor might say to you, but for example, she could say, I've got a 95% a prediction interval that your disease severity will be within some range, some you know, between some lower bound and some upper bound. And you know, when you're told this, the question is, what does it mean? And so I wanna sort of distinguish between an ideal world, sort of the, the thing you might hope it means, and the real world, which sort of corresponds to what it probably actually means. So in the ideal world, f of x, which is supposed to predict the sort of expectation of your label, say your sort of average disease severity, uh, you might hope that this is really sort of conditioning on everything that's known about you, right? So, so this should really be like the expectation of your label distribution conditional on all of your features. And similarly, a 95% prediction interval should really be some statement conditional on everything we know about you, conditional on all of your features. And it should say somehow over the, you know, unmeasured or unrealized randomness of the world, for you personally, conditional on everything we know about you, there's a 95% chance that your label falls within our stated lower bound and upper bound. Now we'll, we'll talk about in a moment why uh, this is sort of too much to hope for, why these estimates cannot mean that. But you know, more likely what they do mean right, is, is um, something that, that takes the randomness not over the unmeasured or unrealized randomness of the world, but instead averages over people. Okay, so the kind of thing you can typically promise for a, a prediction technology that's predicting a mean is that it's perhaps calibrated. We'll talk at length about what exactly that means in a moment. And uh, the prediction interval, you know, at best is probably going to have uh, marginal coverage guarantees, which means that um, if we average not just over your label Y, but we actually average over people as well, then, you know, 95% of the time, um, the label falls within, within the predicted interval. But, you know, note I, said, note I said the label, not your label, because although the expression looks quite similar, it means something quite different to have a marginal guarantee. Because if you have a marginal guarantee, the statement is an average over people. It is saying for 95% of people, um, you know, their label will be contained within the prediction interval we gave to them. But it is explicitly not saying something about your label. And we'll talk about that in a moment as well. So, you know, how come, how come we can't have the thing in the top box? How come we can't ask for true conditional uh, label expectations and true conditional prediction intervals? And if you think about it, it's for like an extremely simple and fundamental reason, which is that if we have some rich feature space, then we've probably never seen anyone exactly like you before, right? Like if, if we've recorded lots of information about you in your medical file, say, um, you're probably the first person we've ever seen who has exactly your set of features X. And so strictly speaking, right? Like we have no information at all. We have seen no samples from the conditional distribution on labels conditional on your features. So, you know, strictly speaking, like, of course we cannot promise anything about this distribution. We cannot predict its expectation. We cannot predict, you know, quantiles, anything like that. And I'd say there's sort of two standard solutions to this problem. So the first is to make heroic assumptions about the world. You might say, okay, you know, I've never seen any samples from, you know, the conditional label distribution conditional on your features before, but, you know, maybe we can assume that everybody's label um, is in fact, everyone's label expectation is maybe, you know, actually a linear function say of their features. This is what we would assume in an ordinary least squares model, for example. And if we assume that, then we've got lots of data that are relevant to the parameters of the model. We can form confidence regions around the parameters and we can translate these into true um, you know, conditional prediction intervals. Of course, these are only as good as the model. And even if the model does a pretty good job uh, on average overall, you know, there's no particular reason to think that the model is true or that it is sort of useful for making uncertainty estimates about particular people. And so of course the other um, 
standard solution to this problem is to give up on these on these uh, conditional guarantees and move to marginal guarantees. And that's what the calibration literature does. We'll talk about calibration in a minute, but calibration is a marginal guarantee. That's also what the conformal prediction literature does. So if you've heard of conformal prediction, which is some method of sort of taking um, taking an arbitrary method for making like point predictions in a sequential prediction setting and affixing prediction intervals around it, uh, conformal prediction provides marginal prediction intervals. Okay, so, so why, you know, what's, what's not to like about marginal prediction intervals? So remember, the doctor has, um, you know, looked you in the eye and, and told you, well, you know, there's a 95% marginal prediction interval that the label falls between L of X and U of X. And you might think to yourself, well, you know, I'm part of a demographic group that represents less than 5% of the population. And that would be a problem because it is entirely consistent with the guarantee, right, with the promise of a marginal prediction interval, both that it has 95% marginal coverage and that for you and moreover for people like you, you know, for anyone from your demographic, for example, that the label falls outside of the prediction interval, you know, 100% of the time because a marginal guarantee is an average over a large and heterogeneous population, and it might, you know, literally have nothing to say about people like you, right? right? It's saying, you know, the prediction interval fails to cover the target five on five percent of people, but that five percent of people might have, you know, significant relevant structure. Now, of course, you know, we can run multiple studies. We can we can uh, compute prediction intervals for different populations, and so. You know, why don't we just do that, right? So, so maybe you can ask the doctor, well, what about for people like me? And the question is, again, what does that mean? So the doctor could tell you, well, for African Americans under the age of 50, the 95% prediction interval ranges from A to B. For women with a family history of diabetes, the 95% prediction interval ranges from C to D. For people with egg allergies and no history of smoking, the 95% prediction interval is from E to F. And again, the problem is that you might belong to all of these demographic groups, all of which are medically relevant, right? These are not mutually exclusive. And yet it is you know, totally consistent with the guarantees of marginal prediction intervals that for example, uh, these prediction intervals might be disjoint, right? How should, you, how should you like interpret this? Okay. And so that's what's sort of not to like about um, marginal guarantees. Let's now talk about sequential prediction and, and sort of the assumptions that we might make or prefer not to make. Okay, so, so in a sequential prediction problem, people are, are arriving one at a time. You don't get to see sort of a, a batch of people first. You know, people are arriving one at a time and you have to make predictions, you have to make decisions as they arrive, okay, before you, before you sort of see lots more data. And so um, conformal prediction, you know, it doesn't matter if you've, Heard about that or not, it's some technique for making, you know, taking procedures for making sequential predictions and affixing them with marginal prediction intervals. And the assumption, the basic assumption um, that goes into basically all conformal prediction work is that the data is exchangeable, which basically means the future should look like the past. Okay, so it means the data distribution should be invariant to permutation. Maybe the easiest way to get this is to just assume that the data is IID. But, you know, again, this is often violated. So thinking about our particular scenario where we've got, um, you know, a, a pandemic quickly moving through a population, you might have unexpected covariate shift, right? The demographics of patients can change suddenly and dramatically in unanticipated ways, right? The, the distribution on their features, um, you know, if that happens, you know, your data is not exchangeable. You could have label shift, right? The conditional distribution on labels, conditional on features might change. That might happen, for example, if we start to develop better treatments. You might worry about strategic effects, you know, like if we're deploying a, an algorithm that is predicting whether people are going to repay loans so that we can decide whether to give them loans, or if we're making hiring decisions or college admissions decisions, then we might expect the data distribution to not be static because people are going to manipulate their features to try to optimize for the deployed classifier, which you might frequently therefore have to retrain, which will therefore frequently change the data distribution. 
or you might just be interested in something that sort of um, inherently is not exchangeable, like time series data, right? Like if, if the data is um, correlated, for example, I want to predict disease severity for you by time, then of course it looks different if I if I permute it. And so, you know, having told you this, again, the high level goal of this work is to mitigate both of these problems at the same time for sequential prediction. So first we wanna make stronger than marginal guarantees. Okay, of a sort I'll, I'll explain it at length in a moment. And we also wanna be able to do this while assuming nothing about the data. So we wanna assume that you know, the data is gonna arrive in this potentially like adversarial way uh, so that you know, we're not making any assumptions about the data that might turn out to be wrong when we actually you know, go to deploy the algorithm say. And we're gonna, you'll see, we're gonna give a very general technique. So maybe the um, you know, headline result is that we can do this for prediction intervals, but um, you know, we also do it for predicting means. We also do it for predicting variances or other higher moments of the label distribution. Uh, you know, since we assume nothing at all about the, about the labels that we're trying to predict, you can have you know, an arbitrary point prediction method that you like, right? Like maybe you're training some complicated deep neural network to make these predictions. And we can think about the labels that we're trying to predict as the, the residuals, the errors of your neural network. And so we can sort of estimate uncertainty about your predictions. And so we can do this for you know, means, variances, other higher moments. And, and as you see the technique, it's quite general. So you know, it really applies to almost any um, property of the label distribution that you might like. So if we don't cover your favorite property of the label distribution, you know, like it's likely we can, we can handle it. Okay. So let me start by talking about calibration and, and mean prediction because this concern about uh, marginal guarantees that they are just averages over a large and heterogeneous population arises, you know, not just for uncertainty estimation, but even just for mean estimation, All right? Like if I'm trying to predict um, the mean outcome, you know, the mean of some label, but, you know, what I mean by that is I am averaging not just over your label distribution, but over people, then you might already worry that it says very little about you if you represent, a, you know, if you're, if you're part of some small demographic group, you know, thrown into a much larger uh, heterogeneous group of people. And there was a very elegant way proposed to handle this called, called multi-calibration. We're going to call it mean multi-calibration because we're going to talk about more general notions uh, by Hebert Johnson et al. back in, in 2018. And so let me, in the next two slides, tell you first what calibration is, and then I'll tell you what multi-calibration is, and then I'll tell you how to extend this very nice idea to other uh, things you might want to predict, like prediction intervals. So I'll, I'll explain this to you in a, in a sequential setting because that's what we're gonna talk about today, but you can also think about this in a batch setting if you want. But in a sequential setting, you are given sequentially one at a time in rounds, a sequence of examples that will consist of some feature vector X coming from some arbitrary feature domain, which I'll write as capital X, paired with a label Y which for the purposes of this talk, let's think about as a real number that lives between zero and one. And so a sequence of such examples, you know, if I've been engaged in, in this prediction process for T, capital T time steps, a sequence of such, such examples is just a sequence of T pairs of features and labels. And while this process has been going on, you know, I, the algorithm will have made various predictions for what I think the mean is gonna be. And so let's call the predictions that I've made uh, Y bars. I'll put a bar on top of the Y to denote a prediction. And so the sequence of predictions that corresponds to the sequence of examples I've seen are, are just a sequence of T uh, numbers also between zero and one. Okay. And so let's define some notation now. So given a subset of the feature space, Okay, so given some subset of the features that I've seen, for example, um, let me write mu of s to denote the sum over all of the time steps 
um, such that the person that I saw at time step t was a member of group S of the true label. Okay, so mu of S is just a sum of the true labels for all of the people who are in group S. And similarly, mu bar of S is the, the same quantity, but for our predictions. So mu bar of S is the sum of the predicted labels for all of the people that I've seen who are in demographic group S. Okay, now if I was making perfect predictions, um, even if my predictions were sort of perfectly unbiased, conditional on the features, then I would expect that at least if um, I'd seen enough examples to you know average out things like noise, that that I should you know expect mu of s to be equal to mu bar of s, or at least very close, right? And that's my goal, right? If I'm making good predictions, then over any set, you know as averaged over any set, my predictions should be equal to the to the true labels. And so that's going to be the thing that we ask for when we define mean consistency. Okay, so a predictor mu is going to be said to be mean consistent on a set S if mu of S is equal to mu bar of S, if our, if our predicted labels are on average equal to the real labels uh, conditional on, on uh, people who are in this set S. And, and we'll allow for a relaxation of this, um, you know, since we aren't going to be able to make perfect predictions, we'll say that a predictor is alpha mean consistent on a set S if these two quantities differ by at most alpha times T. Okay, so mean consistency is pretty simple. It's just asking that our predictions are like right on average, uh, not just overall, but conditional on membership in some set S. Now to talk about calibration, I have to talk about a discretization parameter. Let's see, there's a chat here. Should the alpha mean consistency hold with probability one? So, so far I haven't said anything about that. I've just defined some notion of mean consistency. I can talk about a set of predictions and a set of examples, and I can say they are or are not mean consistent. But of course, when we give an algorithm, you know, there will inevitably have to be some uh, probability of failure. Okay. So to talk about calibration, I have to talk about discretization. Okay, so I will call my discretization parameter M. And um, what this parameter will parameterize is, is some discrete grid. So the labels are you know, real numbers between zero and one. I'm gonna think about this discrete grid discretized at the level of one over M. So zero, one over M, two over M, so on and so forth. And I will say that a particular prediction Y bar is in bucket I if it is closer to grid point I over M than it is to any other grid point. Okay, so I'll make like real valued predictions, but think of each prediction as being like associated with its closest grid point. Okay, that's what the buckets are telling us. And given a particular set of people, a particular subset of the feature space, uh, I will write S of I to denote the subset of people who both lie in S, whose features are in group S, and um, for whom I have made predictions that are, that are in bucket I, for whom I've made predictions that are roughly I over M, okay? And with this notation in mind, you know, with this notation out of the way, I can tell you what calibration means. Um, and we just say that a sequence of predictions that I've made is alpha M calibrated if, for every bucket, for each of the M buckets, we satisfy alpha mean consistency on, um, on the set of all people for whom we've made predictions in bucket I. Okay, so, so like historically, this has been talked about in the context of weather prediction it, where it's sort of really easy to think about. If I am making uh, weather forecasts, like I think you know tomorrow there's a 10% chance of rain or there's a 20% chance of rain, uh, calibration, means that you know, on all of the days for which I've predicted a 10% chance of rain, it should rain roughly 10% of the time. On all of the days for which I've predicted a 20% chance of rain, it should rain roughly 20% of the time. And multi-calibration asks for something um, natural, but much stronger. So multi-calibration is gonna be defined and parameterized by some large and arbitrary 
collection of overlapping sets. So think about G as categorizing all of the demographic groups that you know you can think of that you might possibly care about. Okay, so you know like Hispanic black women under the age of 55, people without egg allergies who you know don't have a family of history of diabetes. You know whatever whatever you think of, you can like throw that into this collection of demographic groups. It's fine if there's lots of them. It's fine if they intersect with each other. And we will say that a sequence of predictions is not just calibrated, but multi-calibrated, alpha M multi-calibrated with respect to some set of demographic groups. If for every bucket and for every demographic group S in my collection, then um, we are alpha mean consistent on the set of people in demographic group S for whom I made a prediction in bucket I. So it just means that we should be calibrated not just overall, but we should also be calibrated. Um, we should also be calibrated on the subset of people in each demographic group. Uh, I see some notification that Rahul Deb has raised his hand. Uh, if anyone wants to ask like a clarifying question, how about just like unmute yourself because I, I can't really uh, monitor things very well. So, so is there a question? Uh, let me actually. I need to allow him to unmute himself. Uh, okay. okay. So that. Rahul, you could ask now. Oh, sorry. Just because this is important, Aaron, just a clarification on your previous slide. In the definition of your alpha mean consistency, should that yep. be alpha T on the right hand side or alpha the uh, number of elements in S? Good point. Yeah. So it should be alpha T, but good catch. So you might think it's like more natural to write alpha times the cardinality of S here, right? Because if we really want to interpret these as means, Right, these are sums right now. If we want to interpret these as means, we should be dividing by the cardinality of S, not, not T. And, and yet here I've written alpha T. And there's going to be sort of a fundamental reason for that, which is that um, it is going to be impossible to promise anything for groups that are too small. Right? For, for example, if I've only seen a single member of a demographic group, then it is just hopeless to try to argue that I've gotten anything right about their distribution at all. And so what is going to come out of this definition is that we will, in a sort of smoothly parametrized way, make weaker promises about smaller groups. And that's kind of inevitable, right? sort of just from a statistical point of view, it's not going to be possible to um, promise anything about teeny tiny groups. And this definition allows us to give sort of a smoothly degrading guarantee with the size of the group. I should have pointed that out. Thanks. Thank you. All right. And so, you know, this is a nice definition. It's not ours, uh, you know, multi-calibration. But once you see it, you sort of see, okay, well, it's, it's sort of easy to extend to all sorts of other distributional quantities, right? Like basically calibration is some nice promise I might have, you know, overall, overall over the whole population. Multi-calibration is asking for this promise to hold not just on the whole population, but you know, remarkably simultaneously uh, on every subpopulation defined by a demographic group you care about. So let's do the same thing for prediction intervals. So again, suppose we we're seeing a sequence of examples um, and what we're doing every day is we're making a prediction. We're predicting um, an interval, you know, like a lower bound or an upper bound, okay, which is just a, a pair of points each between zero and one. And our goal is that, for example, our intervals should cover the label with probability 95%. So again, we're going to have to talk about bucketing, discretization, but we'll just do it the same way as before. We'll say that a prediction interval, which is now defined by two points, is in bucket IJ if the left-hand side is in bucket I and the right-hand side is in bucket J. And we will say that a, a sequence of prediction intervals is now alpha m multivalid if uh, for some coverage target, one minus delta. So think about 95%, for example. And again, for a collection of demographic groups, which can be large, can be arbitrary, can be intersecting. If what we have, um, informally speaking, is that our prediction intervals cover 95% of the labels, not just overall as averaged over the whole population, but also as averaged over any of the demographic groups in G. Okay, and then more formally, what we're asking for is that if we sum 
over all of the time steps in which the person who showed up was in one of the demographic groups we cared about and in which we made a, pr a prediction that fell into some particular bucket, IJ, that uh, the proportion of times that we cover the label, that the label falls within our prediction interval should be uh, roughly one minus delta, should be you know 95%, say. And again, we'll, we'll parameterize this by alpha and we'll ask that this quantity be less than alpha T to say that we are alpha M multivalid. Okay, so just the direct analog of multi-calibration, but for, for coverage now. All right, and before we start proving things, let me like tell you the last thing I need to tell you about the model. So we're gonna wanna make predictions that satisfy various uh, multi-validity or multi-calibration guarantees in an online adversarial setting. So what does that mean? So, um, this is some interaction that's gonna proceed in rounds, which I'll index by little t and range from one to capital T. And in each round, the adversary will select some arbitrary feature vector and also some label, and will show the feature vector to the learner, but not the label. And now the learner, you know, having the benefit of knowing everything that's happened up until now and knowing the feature vector for today's patient, say, has to make a prediction. Okay, we'll talk about different kinds of predictions. So for now, I'll just call it PT. So, but, but you know, it could be a prediction of a mean if we want mean multi-calibration. It could be a prediction of a variance if we want to calibrate to some higher moment like variance. It could be a prediction interval. And only after making the prediction um, does the learner observe the true label. And the adversary, again, you know, can be like worst case, knows what the learner is doing, could be doing anything, trying to screw up the learner. Uh, and the goal is that the learner should be able to promise, um, you know, your favorite multi-validity guarantee. So multi-calibration or moment multi-calibration or calibration, uh, you yeah, know, multi-validity for these prediction intervals in the worst case over adversaries. Okay. And, and so let me tell you how to, let's sort of work in some detail through the solution for mean multi-calibration because I think that the mean multi-calibration is the simplest case, but the machinery that we will develop to solve the, the, the sort of online problem for mean multi-calibration will be quite general and will allow us to then pretty quickly extend it to, uh, for example, prediction interval multi-validity. Okay, so, so let's work through in detail the case of mean multi-calibration and then, and then explain at the end how this extends to prediction interval multi-validity or probably, you know, your favorite like multi-valid estimates of any kind of distributional quantity. And so what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to talk about our multi-calibration error that results from, you know, like a, a particular constraint, right? Like multi-calibration asks that we sort of make unbiased predictions conditional on both a demographic group S uh, in our collection of demographic groups that we care about and conditional on the bucket we make a prediction in. Okay, so, so you know, there's different kinds of multi-calibration errors that we can blame on different demographic groups and buckets. Let's just give a name. Let's call out to the sort of multi-calibration error that up through, you know, time step C, say, that is due to demographic group S and uh, bucket I. Okay, and all that is, is the sum over all of the time steps up until day C of the indicator of whether we care about this time step from the perspective of demographic group S and bucket I. So the indicator of whether um, the feature vector that showed up at day T was in demographic group S and whether the prediction that we made at day T was in bucket I of, you know, and we'll, we'll multiply that by the, the difference between the label that we observed and the prediction that we made. Right, and, and sort of, by construction, right, like these quantities are directly relevant to us in the sense that, you know, just like translating the definition, um, if at the end of time, if at time capital T, I can promise that the average value of all of these, you know, uh, accumulated losses is less than alpha, okay, for all demographic groups and for all buckets, 
that will mean that our predictions turned out to be alpha m multi-calibrated. Okay, so we're gonna like keep track of these like accumulating losses and we're gonna try to develop algorithms that will guarantee that they are small. Okay, and, and so here's the basic idea. And, um, you know, we sort of take inspiration from this, this very nice paper of, of Fudenberg and Levine from, um, I think it was published in 1995. And it's a fundamentally game theoretic approach. So, so what do we want to do? You know, we want to make sure that the max of all of these quantities V, right, the max over all demographic groups and all buckets I is small. Okay, um, so, so the max is kind of like an annoying function analytically. And so, you know, if you come from machine learning, it's very tempting to bound to work not with this max, but to work with some surrogate loss function, which which has come to be known as a soft max function, which is just, you know, rather than thinking about the maximum over all of these quantities, let's think about the sum over all of these quantities of, of some exponential of the quantity. Okay, so, so this is sort of a much more nicely behaved function, you know, it's like differentiable, it's got a nice Taylor expansion, if we want to take like a first order approximation of this function. And it, it, it's a good upper bound on, on what we want, right? Like if we can upper bound our surrogate loss instead, you know, then by taking the log of it and dividing by eta, which is some parameter we're gonna set later, we really have upper bounded the quantity that we wanted, the max over all of these Vs. And moreover, like we haven't, we haven't given up much by concentrating on this much more nicely behaved function, which is that, which is to say, this is basically a, a quite a tight upper bound on the Vs uh, because the only sort of slack that we've introduced here, the only possible slack is a term that depends only logarithmically on the number of groups and, uh, and the number of buckets. So, so we can take like the number of groups to be like truly enormous and, and still like we haven't introduced much slack here. Okay, so forget about upper bounding the max of these V quantities, we're gonna try to upper bound like the soft max of these V quantities, uh, which is just the surrogate loss function L. All right, and you know, like even so, like this quantity is kind of annoying to work with because you know, it's a sum over all of the time steps. And so it depends on the whole history, right? Like, you know, the, you know, an algorithm here, the thing we're trying to design is like an arbitrary mapping from, you know, like histories to predictions. If we have to think about, um, you know, like arbitrary continuations of this interaction, it's going to be like really hard to work with. So let's instead like work with something even simpler. Okay, our goal is to say, well, you know, the past is past, what's happened has happened. And we're not going to think more than one step into the future. Instead, at any moment, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to greedily bound the increase in our surrogate loss function after we've seen the features for the person who's shown up today. Okay, so what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to bound this quantity, which I'll call delta t, and it's a function of the prediction we're going to make today. And this is just the expected increase in the surrogate loss function, given everything we've seen so far, and given that we're going to make prediction yt bar. Okay, and this is well defined because for any adversary, once I've conditioned on the whole history, um, that determines a, a label distribution uh, for today. And it's the, it's the expectation over that label distribution. It's the randomness of that label distribution that this expectation is, is defined for. And if we can show that this delta quantity is small for every history, then that'll be enough for us to bound uh, our surrogate loss, which is the thing we wanna do just by telescoping because our, our expected surrogate loss at the end is just gonna be the you know, telescoping sum of all of these uh, expected increases in surrogate loss over all of the rounds. Okay. And so let's take advantage of the fact that a, you know, a soft max is a nice well-behaved function. Um, and sort of state a simple lemma, okay? Which is that the expected increase in our surrogate loss function, if we make prediction Y bar, can be upper bounded by this well-behaved expression. So there's, you know, a bunch of scary looking terms in here, but the thing I wanna point out is that the dependence on both, you know, the dependence on 
um, the label of the adversary, okay, is linear, okay? And, and we have sort of this nice linear term, the difference between the expected label of the adversary and the prediction we make, okay? That's gonna be multiplied by some constant, which depends on the feature vector that showed up today and the bucket in which our prediction lies. Okay, plus some term that, it, that, that is truly a constant that, that depends on nothing. Okay, and this constant, which is gonna be relevant later, corresponds to the sum, not over all of the demographic groups, but just over the demographic groups for which the person who arrived at day T is a member. Okay, so all of the demographic groups you belong to of, you know, some expression of, of these losses. Okay. And the proof of this is, is you know, like a, it's a first order expansion. Um, yeah, we upper bound it using a Taylor series. So, so, you know, here we're taking advantage of the fact that we used like a nice well-behaved surrogate loss function. Okay. So for this audience, I don't need to give you much reminding about what a zero sum game is. Let me just remind you of the notation we're gonna use. We're gonna talk about zero sum games in which we identify the minimization player with the learner and the maximization player with the adversary. Okay, and we'll write A1 and A2 for the finite strategy spaces of the learner and the adversary, which we'll define in a moment, um, and Q1 and Q2 for their, their space of mixed strategies. And like the one fact about zero sum games, which you know is is going to be relevant, is is the min max theorem, which says basically that the order of play doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who goes first in a zero sum game. And the reason that's going to be useful for us is because in the interaction we are actually involved in, the learner is going first, right? Like we have a fixed algorithm that's supposed to do well against all adversaries. So you can imagine that the adversary at every round, since he knows the learner's algorithm, knows his distribution over predictions. So the learner goes first, the adversary goes second. But it's gonna be a lot easier to think about how well we can do in the game we're gonna define if we imagine that the adversary goes first, right? The adversary is first going to tell us what his label distribution is. And for obvious reasons, prediction is a lot easier if you know the thing that you're trying to predict already, okay? And what von Neumann's min-max theorem says is that without loss of generality, we can think about this second easier case, even though we're sort of living in the, in the sort of first seemingly harder case. Okay, so we're gonna define a zero sum game against between a learner who will be the minimization player and whose strategy space will correspond to uh, predictions and the adversary who's gonna be the maximization player uh, and whose strategy space corresponds to labels. And the utility function in this game is just gonna be the upper bound we proved on, uh, on delta T, the expected increase in our surrogate loss function. And, and what we wanna do is we wanna argue that the value of this game is small so that we know that there's always gonna be a strategy for the learner that will guarantee that this expected increase is small. And so what are the action spaces for the players? Well, you know, a nice thing about this utility function is it is linear in the strategy of the adversary. It depends only on the expected label of the adversary, which is realizable, you know, any expected label is realizable by just randomizing over, over um, a pair of two pure strategies, zero and one. So without loss of generality, we can take the adversary's pure strategy space to be just, you know, binary labels. And it's not quite linear in the, um, in the label player's predictions. I mean, it kind of looks linear over here, but the issue is this constant here actually depends on what bucket the, um, the learner's prediction falls into. And, and so we can't just take the learner's action space to be zero and one and, and to, make, to, uh, to make sure the min-max theorem like really applies here, we need a finite strategy space. And so we'll take the finite strategy space for the learner to be some discretization of the unit interval you know, zero, one over RM, two over RM, so on and so forth, where R is gonna be some discretization parameter. But here R is really a nuisance parameter in that everything will get better as we make R bigger and R will not show up in our running time. So, you know, think about R as being arbitrarily large. We, we just can't take it to be infinity, but think about it as a billion or a trillion or something along those lines. And so here's the idea. All right, from here on out, it's easy. Oh, sorry, Aaron, can I ask another clarification? Since yes. you gave me permission to unmute myself, what is the difference between R and M? 
So M um, is a parameter of the multi-calibration guarantee. M defines the bucketing, which is we should think about as how coarse a promise of calibration is, how coarse or fine. R is some nuisance parameter, you know, uh, which will like show up in our theorem, but we can make it like vanish by just taking it as, as large as possible. So, so M is actually like a meaningful thing. It defines the coarseness of the guarantee we're going to promise. R is not. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So we want to bound the value of this game. And remember, it, for multi mean multi-calibration, we're trying to predict a mean. And it's very easy to predict a mean if you already know what the distribution is. OK, so let's bound the value of the game by imagining that the adversary goes first and first announces their distribution. OK, if the adversary announces their distribution, then by the time it's the learner's time to play, he already knows what the expected label is. OK, and so what he really wants to do is just predict that expected label exactly, which will just zero out this whole term. OK, now I can't quite do that because the expected label is a real number and we've limited him to this discrete strategy space, but he can almost do that. He can pick a label that is within plus or minus our discretization parameter, 1 over RM of the expectation. And so we can't zero this thing out, but we can make it very small. We can make it, you know, eta over RM. OK, and again, think about R as, you know, a trillion or whatever your favorite large number is. And you know, okay, it's sort of like trivial to predict an expectation uh, if you already know what it is. But like the magic of the min-max theorem is that we can like apply this and just conclude that the learner can actually guarantee this even if he has to like announce his strategy first because he has a fixed algorithm. Um, and the the adversary can, you know, try his best, you know, give, give it his worst. Uh, still the learner can obtain this value for the game, although this is a non-constructive argument. And so what we immediately get non-constructively, we'll make it constructive in a moment, just by applying the minimax theorem, is that for every adversary and for every history and for every round, the learner has some distribution over predictions guaranteed to exist by the minimax theorem, such that his expected loss at the end of that round is no more than his actual realized loss yesterday times the small multiplicative factor. And since the loss at round zero, if you remember how we defined this, is just two times the number of groups times n, we can just telescope this to upper bound the expected loss at the final round. And remembering that our surrogate loss function can be used to upper bound our multi-calibration error and doing some algebra, you get the following very nice theorem, which is that there's an algorithm that for any set of groups G and for any adversary uh, guarantees that your alpha M multi-calibrated, where you have, where you're bound on, on the multi-calibration error alpha is this sort of nuisance term plus something that looks like the square root of log of the number of groups divided by T. And you can make this nuisance term as small as you want. So you should, you should sort of read this as two plus epsilon times, you know, square root the log of the number of groups divided by T. Okay. And, and note that it's the log of the number of groups. And so you can think about the set of demographic groups as you know, truly enormous. And you can get a high probability bound as well. OK. So that was a non-constructive argument. But, but like we actually want like an algorithm. Um, but it, OK, there, there's some like you know, algebra. There's some like work to actually like deriving the algorithm. But like at the, in some sense, like by the time you get here, there's like no more room for creativity. Like we know what the algorithm is. It is the minimax equilibrium for the learner in this game that we've defined. So, so you just have to like inevitably like crank through it and like derive what the algorithm is. And in this case, when you do that, the algorithm is actually extremely simple. Okay, this is the algorithm that comes out when you compute the minimax equilibrium of the game. Let me just tell you what it is. Okay. So at the beginning of each round t, you're going to observe xt, the feature vector from that round, which is going to allow you to compute these constants that showed up in the utility function for our, for our game, which are, remember, just the sum over the demographic groups for which x is a member of these exponential terms. 
And there's three cases. Maybe all of these you know, numbers C are positive, in which case you should predict one. Or maybe all of these numbers C are negative, in which case you should predict zero. And if neither of those are the case, it must be that you can find you know, two adjacent buckets, I star and I star plus one, for which CI has the opposite sign as CI plus one. Okay, so find such a bucket. Okay, the, there must exist such a bucket such that these two numbers have opposite signs, right? Their, their product is less than or equal to zero, which means there is some way to randomize between these two buckets so that the expected value of this C quantity is zero. Find that number, call it PT. And all you're gonna do, right, is you're gonna randomize between playing basically the biggest number in bucket I star and the smallest number in bucket I star plus one up to this discretization parameter, one over RM. Okay, so with probability PT, you're gonna predict that the label is I star over M minus this, this you know, annoying term, one over RM, so one over a billion. And with the remaining probability, you'll just predict I star over M. Okay, so this is a randomized algorithm, but it's like only like a little tiny bit randomized. And it's, al it's also very simple, right? Once you've computed these numbers, and, and this might involve enumerating all of the groups for which an individual is a member, which is gonna dominate the runtime if, if people can be members of many demographic groups, the whole thing is elementary. All right, so I see I've got you know, only 10 minutes left and, and I wanna leave time for questions. So let me just point out that very little about this strategy was specific to means, okay? So, so we can do the same thing, but for prediction intervals. We can write down um, these error terms V corresponding now to a particular demographic group and a particular bucket for which a prediction interval might fall, right? These things are just um, amongst all of the people who were in the demographic group and for whom we made a prediction interval that fell into the specified bucket. Like on average, how much did we differ from the target 95% coverage? We can use the exact same soft max surrogate loss function to upper bound the max of these things. And we can prove an analogous first order upper bound on the expected increase in, in loss. Okay, we can define the game in the same way. And we can again observe that if only we knew what the distribution was ahead of time, it would be very easy to come up with the appropriate prediction interval. And we can sort of crank through the same machinery let me just skip the details here, uh, but to get sort of an analogous bound, okay? All the terms here look very similar, uh, but now we're talking about prediction intervals. And again, we need to come up with an algorithm, but no room for creativity here. We just need to solve a particular game, you know, solve for the minimax equilibrium of a particular game. In this case, there's no closed form solution as far as we know, but you can still solve the game efficiently by, by solving a linear program. So you can sort of write down the appropriate linear program. You can observe it has only polynomially many variables. It's got exponentially many constraints, it turns out, but, um, but we have a separation oracle for it, which means we can efficiently solve the linear program. And then the algorithm is again, conceptually quite simple. Basically every day you show up, uh, every day someone shows up, you observe their feature vectors and you compute these constants that show up in the utility function for the game that we're solving. That defines some linear program, okay? It's got a lot of variables, but we have a separation oracle. You solve that linear program, which gives you explicitly a distribution over prediction intervals, and then you just sample from that distribution. And this algorithm achieves the quoted multi-validity guarantees, okay? All right, so let me leave six minutes for questions and, and thank everyone for listening. And for anyone who wants to like read more about this, we have the paper online, which has uh, you know all of the details, um, not just for means, which which I went over in some at, at some length, but also for prediction intervals, which I sort of glossed over quickly, and and for moment moment prediction, which I didn't even mention today. So thank you. 
Okay, thank you so much, Aaron, for the talk. Um, and so again, from the audience, if you have any question right now, you can either write it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask directly. Um, so maybe let me start asking a question myself while the audience is thinking about questions. Um, so one thing that I was wondering, but uh, and I think this is um, true, but like, so it, what happens if the groups, the relevant groups change during your algorithm? So say after a certain time, you realize, okay, there was another group that actually is relevant for your problem. So mm -hmm. you're, you can still give the same type of guarantees, right? Yeah, so let me say a couple of things about that. So first, because all of our bounds have only a logarithmic dependence on the number of groups, but like you shouldn't feel compelled to be like stingy with your definition of groups early on. Like you don't have to be like sure something is relevant. Like you think of a group, like throw it on in there, right? Because, you know, even if I have like two to the D groups, I can achieve these bounds after only D rounds of iteration. Um, but, you know, if you do think of another group, it, 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 you know, we don't talk about this in the paper, but it's pretty easy to just sort of throw it in there mid algorithm because the way we derived this algorithm was by taking this greedy perspective, right? Like if this might be a problem if we were sort of trying to solve the whole game at once with like the continuation values. But what we actually prove is that like, no matter what's happened in the past, whatever the sort of current calibration errors are for every group, which are defined for new groups you've just thought of, although we might have done badly on those groups so far, you know, there's a way I can play tomorrow that guarantees that the increase is small. So if you think of a new group, like throw it in, my algorithm can start knowing about it tomorrow and start seamlessly playing according to that new group. Perfect. I see there is a question in the chat. So let me actually read it out. So it's uh, from Amy asks, can you interpret your result in the context of the intersectional woman visiting the doctor's office at the beginning of the talk? What can the doctor tell her now and what is her main takeaway? Good. Yes, yeah, so the nice thing here, right, is we still make point predictions, right? So, so, you know, the doctor doesn't have to say, okay, like, you know, here's your like mean if you're like a woman, here's your mean if you're African-American, right? The doctor just says, okay, here's your, you know, expected severity, here's a prediction interval. And the patient can now interpret this not just as a guarantee that holds as an average over the whole population, but can at her option interpret it as an average over any of the demographic groups that she cares, you know, that she's a member of and that the algorithm was parameterized with, right? And her interpretation will be correct however she choose to inter chooses to interpret it. For example, if there's a 95% prediction interval, it means not just that it covers the label for 95% of all people, but also for 95% of women, for 95% of African Americans, you know, whatever demographic groups she cares about. Um, and sort of right, the, the nice thing about this is it's like one prediction interval, but like it is simultaneously valid on all of these groups, uh, even though they're intersecting. Perfect. Is there any other question from the audience? Can I <clears throat> ask a follow-up question to that? Just, just to make sure, Aaron. So in some sense, this is more meaningful when the fraction of the population you think you're coming from is a constant fraction. If it wasn't a constant, then maybe it's, it's not saying much. Yeah, right? so, so let's see. So it doesn't have to be a constant fraction because we can take alpha to be on the order of one over square root of t. But you're right uh, that you know, when I say that like, you know, the prediction interval is equally valid on every demographic subset, we should remember that these guarantees of alpha multi-validity, which in the end correspond to guarantees of like alpha mean consistency as I've defined them, are um, weaker for smaller groups. Like the error bound, like the error bounds are gonna be bigger if you, if you try to average over a smaller group. So, yeah, like, like if, if all of the demographic groups are at least, you know, some constant fraction of the population, that's great. But alpha, right, right so, so our, our, the error on your group is going to be like alpha times T divided by the fraction of day, you know, divided by like the number of days for which someone from your group showed up. So it's like the inverse um, fraction of the population that your group represents. But we can take alpha to be as small as one over square root of T. So, so it doesn't have to be that these groups are a constant fraction to have a meaningful guarantee, but they shouldn't be like, you know, negligibly small. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. 
Oh, I see a new question from the chat from Izzat. So did you consider external regret minimization algorithm? The setting with the history seems similar. Uh, so I guess it depends what you mean. So in some sense, we're doing something harder than external regret minimization, but it does turn out that the derivation is, is extremely general. So you can, in the same way from first principles by defining a game and bounding the value of the game and, and computing the, you know, and deriving an algorithm by computing an equilibrium of a game, you know, in the same way you can uh, basically rederive all of the literature on regret minimization, not just external regret minimization, but internal regret minimization, all sorts of things. So the framework in which we are, you know, the, the framework that we are using to derive online algorithms is sufficiently powerful that it lets you recover like you know, sleeping experts, you know, mo most of what's known for external regret minimization. But, but as far as I know, the problem that we are solving like cannot be solved as a corollary of the existence of external regret minimization algorithms. The question is, is calibration a generalization of regret? Um, calibration is closely related to what's known as internal regret. Uh, this is a, a result of, of Ricky Vora and, and Dean Foster. Um, so, so you can think of it as asking for something stronger than external regret, but, but it's, you know, you have to squint. It's like asking for something a little bit different. That's a good question. So, so the, Amy asks in the chat, is there a more general notion of correlated equilibrium that corresponds to multi-calibration? Uh, so, so the reason you would think of this question is this close connection between internal regrets and, and calibration. And, you know, one way to compute correlated equilibria is to make sure that every, you know, if, if people are playing a game, that every day they are best responding to a calibrated estimate of what their opponents are going to do. If everyone does that, you can reach a correlated equilibrium. So we are doing something, we are giving something that is stronger than a calibrated notion. Yeah, what does it give you in terms of equilibrium computation? Um, I, I don't have a good, you know, answer offhand. Like it, 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 it will promise something like, you know, you are computing a best response. Like so, so these demographic groups don't make much sense in the game theory setting, but like um, w one way to think about this that's related to sort of the economics that are trying calibration is I'm asking for calibration on some enormous subset of days. So not just all the days, but you know, odd days, even days, days that, you know, like have seven as a prime factor, you know, whatever, some huge subset of days. And I guess the guarantee here is that um, the distribution we would get would have people playing best responses, not just on average. So, so you know, I don't have to, you know, a correlated equilibrium says, okay, even conditional on your instruction being to play left, um, you know, left should really be a best response. I guess this would promise something like, you know, your suggestion is a best response conditional on being told to play left and that, you know, I'm telling to you to do something that happened on, you know, an odd day that was a multiple of seven or something. But I don't know if that's, I don't know if there's an interesting application of that. But it is, it is something stronger, strictly stronger than correlated equilibrium. OK. Uh, seems like there's no more question, unless somebody has a pressing, urgent question. OK, so let me thank the speaker. I don't uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. And thank you for the audience for joining. And yeah, thank you yeah, so much. Th thanks, for, thanks for having me. This is a nice event. Thank you. Bye.